Chapter Seven of the Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Journey Through Death, Part Two. Matters still progressed when Burl stepped out from a group of overshadowing toadstools and halted. He cast his eyes over the landscape and was struck by its familiarity. He was, in fact, very near the spot he had left the night before in that maniacal ride on the back of a flying beetle. He moved back and forth, trying to account for the feeling of recognition. He saw the low cliff then and moved eagerly toward it, passing within fifty feet of Saya's body, now more than half buried in the ground. The loose dirt around the outline of her figure was beginning to topple in little rivulets upon her. One of her shoulders was already half screened from view. Burl passed on, unseeing. He hurried a little. In a moment, he recognized his location exactly. There were the mining bee burrows. There was a thrown away lump of edible mushroom, cast aside as the tribe's folk fled. His feet stirred up a fine dust, and he stopped short. A red puffball had burst here. It fully accounted for the absence of the tribe, and Burl sweated in sudden fear. He thought instantly of Saya. He went carefully to make sure. This was absolutely the hiding place of the tribe. There was another mushroom fragment. There was a spear thrown down by one of the men in his flight. Red dust had settled upon the spear and the mushroom fragments. Burl turned back, hurrying again, but taking care to disturb the dust no more than he could possibly help. The little excavation into which Saya was sinking inch by inch was not in his path. Her body no longer lay above the ground, but in it. Burl went by, frantic with anxiety about the tribe, but about Saya most of all. Her body quivered and sank a fraction into the ground. Half a dozen small streams of earth were tumbling upon her. In minutes, she would be wholly hidden from view. Burl went to beat among the mushroom thickets in quest of the bodies of his tribe's folk. They could have staggered out of the red dust and collapsed beyond. He would have shouted, but the deep sense of loneliness silenced him. His throat ached with grief. He searched on. There was a noise. From a huge clump of toadstools, perhaps the very one he had climbed over in the night, there came the sound of crashings and the breaking of spongy stuff. Twin tapering antennae appeared, and then a monster beetle lurched into the open space, its ghastly mandibles gaping sideways. It was all of eight feet long, and supported by six crooked, saw-toothed legs. Huge multiple eyes stared with preoccupation at the world. It advanced deliberately, with clankings and clashings of a hideous machine. Burl fled on the instant, running directly away from it. A little depression lay in the ground before him. He did not swerve, but made to jump over it. As he leaped, he saw the color of bare flesh. Saya, limp and helpless, sinking slowly into the ground with tricklings of dirt falling down to cover her. It seemed to Burl that she quivered a little. Instantly, there was a terrific struggle within Burl. Behind him was the giant meat-eating beetle. Beneath him was Saya, whom he loved. There was certain death lurching toward him on the evilly crooked legs, and the life he had hoped for lay in a shallow pit. Of course he thought Saya dead. Perhaps it was rage or despair or a simple human madness which made him act otherwise than rationally. The things which raise humans above brute creation, however, are only partly reasonable. Most human emotions, especially the creditable ones, cannot be justified by reason, and very few heroic actions are based on logical thought. Burl whirled as he landed, 
his puny spear held ready. In his left hand, he held the haunch of a creature much like the one which clanked and rattled toward him. With a yell of insane defiance, completely beyond justification by reason, he flung the meat-filled leg at the monster. It hit. Undoubtedly it hurt. The beetle seized it ferociously. It crushed it. There was meat in it, sweet and juicy. The beetle devoured it. It forgot the man standing there, waiting for death. It crunched the leg joint of a cousin or brother, confusing the blow with the missile that had delivered it. When the tidbit was finished, it turned and lumbered off to investigate another mushroom thicket. It seemed to consider then an enemy had been conquered and devoured and that normal life could go on. Then Burl stopped quickly and dragged Saya from the grave the sextant beetles had labored so feverishly to provide for her. Crumbled soil fell from her shoulders, from her face, and from her body. Three little eight-inch beetles with black and red markings scurried for cover in terrified haste. Burl carried Saya to a resting place of soft mold to mourn over her. He was a completely ignorant savage, save that he knew more of the ways of insects than anybody anywhere else. The ecological service which had stocked this planet not being accepted. To Burl, the unconsciousness of Saya was as death itself. Dumb misery smote him, and he laid her down gently and quite literally wept. He had been beautifully pleased with himself for having slain one flying beetle. But for Saya's seeming death, he would have been almost unbearable with pride over having put another to flight. But now he was merely a broken-hearted, very human young man. But long time later Saya opened her eyes and looked about bewilderedly. They were in considerable danger for some time after that because they were oblivious to everything but each other. Saya rested in half-incredulous happiness against Burl's shoulder, as he told her jerkily of his attempt on a night-bound butterfly, which turned out to be a flying beetle that took him aloft. He told of his search for the tribe, and then his discovery of her apparently lifeless body. When he spoke of the monster which had lurched from the mushroom thicket, and of the desperation with which he had faced it, Saya looked at him with warm, proud eyes. But Burl was abruptly struck with the remarkable convenience of that discovery. If his tribesmen could secure an ample supply of meat, they might defend themselves against attack by throwing it to their attackers. In fact, insects were so stupid that almost any object thrown quickly enough and fast enough might be made to serve as sacrifices instead of themselves. A timid, frightened whisper roused them from their absorption. They looked up. The boy Dick stood some distance away, staring at them, wide-eyed, almost convinced that he looked upon the living dead. A sudden movement on the part of either of them would have sent him bolting away. Two or three other bobbing heads gazed affrightedly from nearby hiding places. John was poised for flight. The tribe had come back to its former hiding place simply as a way to reassemble. They had believed both Burl and Saya dead, and they accepted Burl's death as their own doom. But now they stared. Burl spoke, fortunately, without arrogance, and Dick and Tet came timorously from their hiding places. The others followed, the tribe forming a frightened half-circle about the seated pair. Burl spoke again, and presently one of the bravest, Corey, dared to approach and touch him. Instantly, a babble of crude labial language of the tribe broke out. Awed exclamations and questions filled the air. But Burl, for once, showed some common sense. Instead of a vainglorious recital, he merely cast down the long tapering antenna of the flying beetle, 
They looked and recognized their origin. Then Burl curtly ordered Dor and Jack to make a chair of their hands for Saya. She was weak from her fall and the loss of blood. The two men humbly advanced and obeyed. Then Burl curtly ordered the march resumed. They went on, more slowly than on previous days, but nonetheless steadily. Burl led them across country, marching in advance with a matter-of-fact alertness for signs of danger. He felt more confidence than ever before. It was not fully justified, of course. John now retrieved the spear he had discarded. The small party fairly bristled with weapons. But Burl knew that they were liable to be cast away as impediments if flight seemed necessary. As he led the way, Burl began to think busily in the manner that only leaders find necessary. He had taught his followers to kill ants for food, though they were still uneasy about such adventures. He had led them to attack great yellow grubs upon giant cabbages, but they had not yet faced any actual danger, as he had done. He must drive them to face something. The opportunity came the same day in the late afternoon. To the westward, the cloud bank was barely beginning to show the colors that presage nightfall, when a bumblebee droned heavily overhead, making for its home burrow. The little straggling group of marching people looked up and saw the scanty load of pollen packed in the stiff bristles of the bee's hind legs. It sped onward heavily, its almost transparent wings mere blurs in the air. It was barely fifty feet above the ground. Burl dropped his glance and tensed. A slender waisted wasp was shooting upward from an ambush among the noisome fungi of this plain. The bee swerved and tried to escape. The wasp overhauled it. The bee dodged frantically. It was a good four feet in length, as large as the wasp, certainly, but it was more heavily built and could not make the speed of which the wasp was capable. It dodged with less agility. Twice in desperation, it did manage to evade the plunging dives of the wasp. But the third time, the two insects grappled in mid-air, almost over the heads of the humans. They tumbled downward in a clawing, biting tangle of bodies and legs. They hit the ground and rolled over and over. The bee struggled to insert her barbed sting into the more supple body of her adversary. She writhed and twisted desperately. But there came an instant of infinite confusion and the bee lay on her back. The wasp suddenly moved with that ghastly skilled precision of a creature performing an incredible feat instinctively, apparently unaware that it is doing so. The dazed bee was swung upright in a peculiarly artificial pose. The wasp's body curved, and its deadly, rapier-sharp sting struck. The bee was dead, instantly, as if struck dead by lightning. The wasp had stung in a certain place in the neck parts where all the nerve cords pass. To sting there, the wasp had to bring its victim to a particular pose. It was precisely the trick of a denucador, the butcher, who kills cattle by severing the spinal cord. For the wasp's purpose, the bee had to be killed in this fashion, and no other. Burl began to give low-tone commands to his followers. He knew what was coming next, and so did they. When the sequel of the murder began, he moved forward, his tribesmen wavering after him. This venture was actually one of the least dangerous they could attempt. But merely to attack a wasp was a hair-raising idea. Only Burl's prestige plus their knowledge made them capable of it. The second act of the murder drama was gruesomeness itself. The pirate wasp was a carnivore, but this was the season when the wasps raised young. Inevitably, 
there was sweet honey in the half-filled crop of the bee. Had she arrived safely at the hive, the sweet and sticky liquid would have been disgorged for the benefit of bee grubs. The wasp avidly set to work to secure that honey. The bee carcass itself was destined for the pirate wasp's own offspring, and that squirming monstrosity is even more violently carnivorous than its mother. The parent wasp set about abstracting the dead bee's honey before taking the carcass to its young one, because honey is poisonous to the pirate wasp's grub. Yet insects cannot act from solicitude or anything but instinct, and instinct must be maintained by lavish rewards. So the pirate wasp sought its reward, an insane, insatiable, glutinous satisfaction in the honey that was poison to its young. The wasp foiled its murder victim upon its back again and feverishly pressed on the limp body to force out the honey. And this was the reason for its precise manner of murder. Only when killed by the destruction of all nerve currents would the bee's body be left limp like this. Only a bee killed in this exact fashion would yield its honey to manipulation. The honey appeared, flowing from the dead bee's mouth. The wasp, in trembling, gallish ecstasy, devoured it as it appeared. It was lost to all other sights or sensations but its feast. And this was the moment when Burl signaled for the attack. The tribesman's prey was deaf and blind and raptured. It was aware of nothing but the delight it savored. But the men wavered, nevertheless, when they drew near. Burl was first to thrust his spear powerfully into the trembling body. When he was not instantly destroyed, the others took courage. Dor's spear penetrated the very vitals of the ghoul. Jack's club fell with terrific force upon the wasp's slender waist. There was a crackling, and the long, spidery limbs quivered and writhed. Then Burl struck again, and the creature fell into two writhing halves. They butchered it rather messily, but Burl noticed that even as it died, sundered and pierced with spears, its long tongue licked out in one last rapturous taste of the honey that had been its undoing. Some time later, burdened with the pollen-laden legs of the great bee, the tribe resumed its journey. Now Burl had men behind him. They were still timid and prone to flee at the least alarm, but they were vastly more dependable than they had been. They had attacked and slain a wasp whose sting would have killed any of them. They had done battle under the leadership of Burl, whose spear had struck the first blow. They were sharers of his glory, and therefore much more nearly like the followers of a chieftain ought to be. Their new spirit was badly needed. The red puffballs were certainly no less numerous in the new territory the tribe traversed than in the territory they had left. And the season of their ripening was further advanced. More and more of the ground showed the deadly rime of settled death dust. To stay alive was increasingly difficult. When the full spore casting season arrived, it would be impossible, and that season could not be far away. The very next day after the killing of the wasp, survival, despite the red dust, had begun to seem unimaginable. Where earlier one saw a red dust cloud bursting here and there at intervals, on this day there was always a billowing mass of lethal vapor in the air. At no time was the landscape free of a moving mist of death. Usually there were three or four in sight at once. Often there were half a dozen. Once there were eight. It could be guessed that in one day more they would ripen in such monstrous numbers that anything which walked or flew or crawled must breathe in the spores and perish. And that day, just at sunset, 
the tribe came to the top of a small rise in the ground. For an hour they had been marching and counter-marching to avoid the suddenly billowing clouds of dust. Once they had been nearly hemmed in, when three of the dull red mists seemed to flow together, enclosing the three sides of a circle. They escaped then only by the most desperate of sprinting. But now they came to the little hillock and halted. Before them stretched a plain, all of four miles wide, colored brownish, brick-red, by the red puffballs. The tribe had seen mushroom forests. They had lived in them and knew of the dangers that lurked there. But the plain before them was not simply dangerous, it was fatal. To right and left it stretched as far as the eye could see. But away on its farther edge, Burl caught a glimpse of flowing water. Over the plain itself, a thin red haze seemed to float. It was simply a cloud of the deadly spores, dispersed and indefinite, but constantly replenished by the freshly bursting puffballs. While the tribe's folk stood and watched, thick columns of dust rose here and there and at the other place, too many to count. They settled again, but left behind enough of the fine powder to keep a thin red haze over all the plain. This was a mass of literally millions of the deadly growths. Here was one place where no carnivorous beetles roamed and where no spiders lurked. There was nothing here but the sullen columns of dust and the haze that they left behind. And of course, it would be nothing less than suicide to try to go back. End of chapter 7, part 2